Dr. David Sung Kong, director of MIT Media Lab's Community Biotechnology Initiative. Welcome to the Epic Human Podcast. It is epic to be here, Joe. An <laughs> honor to be here and really, really excited. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Wonderful to have you. There's a lot we want to get into. Um, I guess, uh, you know, f first off, you know, we're, we're kind of new friends and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you recently signed on to become an advisor for our firm. I'm, I'm thrilled about that. And uh, yes. more so just thrilled to, you know, kind of get to know a kindred spirit. And, for sure. you know, when we first met, we just like hit it off right away. So, yes, um, really excited. Um, why don't we start by just talking about your role at MIT's Media Lab? Yeah, yeah. Well, first off again, Joe, it's an honor to be here with you. And yeah, just like you said, I think, you know, meeting you and Kim and Andrew right away, it's been such a blast and, um, you know, super fast, just instant connections. And, you know, it's sort of a beautiful thing in life when you find people that have a similar value system and that you feel are like your tribe, you know? I think especially too, as we get older in life, it can be a little bit harder sometimes to like meet and connect with folks. And, and it's just really, really precious to, to meet you and super excited to be here and to build with you. And, um, and yeah, to your question, um, you know, I feel very, very blessed. I've been at the Media Lab. Well, so the, the shorter version of this longer version is I've been at MIT for basically my entire life. Um, my dad was a professor at MIT and I kind of did all my degrees there. Um, I've been in my current role directing the Community Biotech Initiative since 2017. And basically, um, my current job is this sort of resulting flow of many episodes and chapters in my life where earlier on when I was in grad school, I was very focused on the technical field of synthetic biology, which again, I think your audience is pretty probably pretty familiar with, but um, you know, it's a larger engineering framework applied to living systems and was developed at MIT in the early 2000s. And so um, when I was in graduate school there, I'd done a master's at the Media Lab in um, uh, basically microfabrication. So I was working a lot more on chip-based technologies and also how you use um, electron ion beam um, uh, technologies to actually build nanostructures. And so I got really into fabrication. And then right around that time in the early 2000s, this field of synthetic biology emerged and started to take off. And so you had folks like uh, Drew Endy, who was at uh, MIT at that time, Tom Knight, um, a lot of the, the early pioneers of this field who were in non-biology background fields. So these were computer scientists, civil engineers, um, et cetera, coming together and saying, you know, why can't we engineer the living world just like we can engineer computer chips or bridges? And so this whole thing was born right in that kind of period around like, you know, 2002, 2003, maybe a little bit earlier as well, some of the early ideation. And so my PhD was basically focused on um, DNA-based chip synthesis. So like I was using microfluidics, lab on a chip-based technology and applying it to DNA assembly and gene, gene synthesis. And so that was kind of my, my PhD work. And that whole early arc of my career was very technical focused. And then later on, you know, did a postdoc in structural biology and nose on a chip technology. So making olf olfactory receptors that could be expressed and then, um, and then um, employed on chip for sensing, sensing capabilities. And then um, later on after that, I helped to found a synthetic biology center at uh, MIT's Lincoln Laboratory. So I did a, a break kind of in there in the, for, for a year doing a cancer diagnostic startup, but you know, I had a very, very technical career um, in synthetic biology and biological engineering. But at the same time that I was doing all of that, I was also a community organizer and a social justice activist and an artist. And so I had this kind of interesting, and this is a story that leads to how I have the current job I have and why I'm doing what I'm doing. But basically, you know, at that time when I was in graduate school doing this early work in synthetic biology, I was also doing community organizing. And I remember distinctly, um, there was a time where um, the community organizing that I was doing, we had done, we had this like play that we were doing. It was sort of this, uh, um, a counter play to the musical Miss Saigon, because there's a lot of kind of racist aspects of that, that play and that musical. And we had created this counter production and I printed out some posters at, the, at, at MIT. And I remember like one of the faculty like saw these posters and was like, do not use the printer for this. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. And so it was, it was sort of, I, I got this sort of implicit messaging that, okay, I need to keep my activism life like very separate from my technical life that right. I'm going to do this technical work over here and I'm going to do my arts and my activism stuff over here. And I just had this kind of mental idea that these had to be separate things. And so for me, my life really changed a lot when I was at Lincoln Laboratory at MIT because I started to really combine both of those aspects of my life. And um, at the time, again, this was kind of the early 2000s, I had uh, started to organize a art technology and community center that used to be a Chinese language bookstore that my parents had. So um, again, long story short there, my mom and dad, they're Chinese immigrants. 
My dad, fun fact about me, I'm a direct consented of Confucius. Okay, I'm a 75th generation direct descendant <laughs> of Confucius. And so my my dad, my parents, they had opened this Chinese language bookstore. Myself and these community organizers took over the space in around 2004, 2005, started running community open mics out of there and all this arts and community programming. And then as the years went on, I started to learn about something called the do-it-yourself biology or, or well, really it's the, the DIY bio movement. We started later in later ages, a later time is reframing it as community biology, but basically it's for these folks setting up these kind of grassroots biology labs all around the world. And I was there, um, I, there was this, this event called, uh, um, when I was at Lincoln Lab, where the FBI basically brought together this network of community biology labs. This is in 2012. And I was there with my Lincoln Lab hat on watching these people from all around the world that were setting up these community biology labs talk about their work, except it was being hosted by like, you know, a dude in a black suit from the FBI being like, okay, up next from, you know, New York, we've got GenSpace, what are you guys up to? And, you know, I had, I was there nominally with a biosecurity hat on, but I was watching all of these, these folks like talking about this amazing grassroots work they're doing. And as an activist and an organizer, I was like, I want to build one of these labs, you know, I want to do this work. And so we had that community center I was mentioning that, you know, used to be a Chinese language bookstore. We turned it into a community space and we built out a biology lab in that, that building. And so, um, and this was probably in 2014, we built out that biology lab while I was still at Lincoln Laboratory. And so I started kind of on this path of combining my organizing work with my technical work. And actually, uh, you know, we're talking in the, in the pre-call a little bit about uh, George Church, who's one of my dear colleagues and friends, professor of genetics at Harvard. And George and I um, started in 2015 teaching this class called How to Grow Almost Anything. And initially, we were teaching that as a, a global curriculum to basically folks all around the world that wanted to get into synthetic biology and life sciences. And we started teaching that class out of my community biology lab in Cambridge in this like basically renovated bookstore storefront that we had built a biology lab in the basement for. And so around that time, again, I started to really realize that, you know, my interests in activism were connected to these deep themes around equity, justice, who has access, who doesn't have access, who, who has agency in shaping the future of these very powerful technologies. And my technical work really started to change then as well. And I started to focus more, instead of just trying to develop, you know, cutting edge tools and technologies, it became, how do we open source? How do we share protocols? How do we enable diverse communities wherever you are um, to work with these technologies and really lower those barriers of access? And so, as I was, and, but at that time when I was at Lincoln Lab, I kind of had like four jobs. I had like my Lincoln Lab job, which was very technical. We were working at that time at Lincoln Lab on, you know, gut on a chip type applications. So I was very much into microbiome science and research, and we were building these 3D printed artificial guts, working on um, open sourcing um, uh, microfluidic designs through this platform we built called Metafluidics. And, but all of that work started again, shifting into this focus around access. And then uh, on my nights and evenings, I was working at EMW where we had these, you know, amazing young people doing, you know, beatboxing and music and electronic What's arts. Um, uh, sorry, EMW is uh, East Meets West Bookstore, um, which was again my my uh, my parents' Chinese language true. bookstore. But we we called it EMW <clears throat> in homage to my dad, who mm. was uh, an electromagnetic wave theory professor at uh. MIT. So <laughs> his three favorite letters and my three favorite letters were EMW, and it also stood for East Meets West <laughs> right, in right. homage to the Chinese language bookstore. So right. so that was the art technology community space that we had this this uh, biology lab in. So. Right around that kind of era in like the mid, you know, 2010s, I'm teaching how to grow with uh, with George. We're doing starting to do some like interesting bio art projects, and then but I was doing this very technical work um, at at a Lincoln Laboratory, and I was just getting burned out, you know, because I it was like seven days a week constant work, and um, in 2017 that's when I joined the Media Lab. So that was a long preamble to get mm -hmm. to, to why I'm doing this this uh, the work that I currently do. And my, my lab that I direct now, the Community Biotechnology Initiative, is basically exploring in a rigorous way that intersection between the life sciences, synthetic biology, and biological engineering, but then connecting that with an activist perspective, looking at who does have access to these technologies, who's, who has agency to help shape their futures. And so my current work in my lab, a big part of what we do is technical tool development. So can we actually make things like, um, you know, for example, one of the projects uh, one of my uh, former grad students, uh, Teja, was working on was a tool called Zapor. It's a, a DNA electroporator. And for those of you that know, DNA, DNA electroporation is a pretty fundamental process in, in biological engineering and life sciences. You basically create a, a voltage and um, you know, it causes a cell's pores to open up and then you can get DNA to flow inside um, by, by applying this, this voltage. And so these, these machines are typically thousands of dollars. And my student, again, thinking about kind of global access, 
was trying to think, okay, what what type of uh, um, tools out there have high voltage supplies? And one that he identified was a was a fly swatter. So like the mosquito swatter, which is literally everywhere around the world. That type of a supply chain is, and, then, and again, thinking about kind of modern bioeconomy, a huge part of the question is supply chain. Who has access to these reagents? Who has access to these materials? And so we basically figured out how to hack a fly swatter and turn it into an electroporator that was at least as good as current commercial electroporation systems, but about a thousand times cheaper. And so tools like that are some of the things that we work on in my lab. Um, again, we work a lot on sharing platforms to enable people to um, share best practices, different types of designs, and so on. And then um, another big aspect of my work is around community organizing. So I mentioned a little bit about the community biology lab that we built out in, uh, in my community center. And uh, there's this event that I organized that actually just, just wrapped up uh, yesterday called the Global Community Bio Summit that brings together the global network of the folks that are working on these labs. So they're basically community organizers in um, cities and neighborhoods all around the world, engaging their communities in the grassroots using um, these community spaces. And so we basically at MIT, since I joined um, this lab, the, the Media Lab in 2017, have been bringing that global community together. So a lot of organizing work and movement building work too. So I also collaborate very closely with the Center for Collective Intelligence at MIT. And um, again, one of my dear uh, friends, colleagues, and mentors is Tom Malone, who's really one of the fathers of collective intelligence. And um, with Tom, we've been uh, developing a framework called Supermind Design. And in short, you know, you may be familiar with design thinking. Um, so the idea behind Supermind Design is, you know, can we design what Tom has framed in this wonderful book called Superminds, which are basically um, groups of humans that are organized together in some format to try to achieve some type of collective purpose. And it could be in the context of a market, a hierarchy, a democracy, or in my case, you know, what, what I care most about are communities. And so, um, so with Tom, we've been thinking about supermind design, but thinking of that, about that in the context of this larger community biology movement. How can we best structure these communities so that they can have um, achieve the larger purposes that we hope that they can achieve around democratizing these technologies? So, um, and so again, with the movement created work, I also work with folks like Marshall Gans from Harvard Kennedy School, who's a legendary movement builder, uh, social justice organizer. And then I also do a lot of work in the arts. So, um, you know, again, one of the beautiful parts about being at the Media Lab. The Media Lab really prides itself on multidisciplinary research, but in particular exploring different domains of creativity. And there's four domains that we really try to emphasize, and one is science, the other is technology and engineering, the third is art, and the fourth is design. And so there's some 30 different research groups at the Media Lab, and all of those groups have in some way an exploration of all four of those domains of creativity. So for me, as a really kind of multidisciplinary human, um, I, I just feel so blessed and honored to be able to be back at the Media Lab where I did my PhD and, and running the current lab that I run, because um, it really lets me explore all of those different domains and do it in one job instead of like four jobs, which is how it was uh, you know, prior to coming to the lab. Makes sense, makes sense. So, so let's, let's uh, unpack some of this, especially around equity. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, distributing both knowledge and the tools to experiment. Yes. Right. Yes. And I, I wanna I wanna get your take on this because on I, I see this kind of in, in, in with two lenses. One is equity, education, yes, um, access, and, and and getting people into the space who otherwise wouldn't be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The other piece of it is, hey, if we if we get ideas and smart people working on this everywhere, it's gonna move the the knowledge base. Yep. farther, faster, yep. and accelerate things. Like, yep. Yep. How do, so, so A, how do you think about those two lenses? And B, yep. what, what tangible tools do you need? You mentioned the fly swatter, but like yeah. I'm thinking about you know, wet labs exactly. and robotics. Like how do you, how do you make that accessible yeah. to someone across the, the country or across the world? Yeah, such a great question. So um, here I really want to shout out and acknowledge um, one, again, another uh, colleague and mentor, Neil Gershenfeld professor at, uh, at MIT who taught, he directs the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT, so information and matter. And um, he had this amazing class at MIT called How to Make Almost Anything. Okay, it's a digital fabrication course. And what Neil basically kind of posited or hypothesized was, or, or, or asked was, you know, what is the minimum tool set that you need to make almost anything? Right. So, what are those tools? Are they like laser cutters, three D printers, milling machines? Um, you know, what are, what is the tool set? And over the course of a number of years, they, him and his his researchers, really started to rigorously ask that question, define these tool sets, and through this course, started to teach students at MIT how to quote unquote make almost anything. 
And over time, um, as uh, the MIT classroom got really big, they started doing this work globally. So students from all around the world would tune into MIT globally. And that started getting so big that they launched their own um, uh, what's called a Fab Academy, which is now a, founda a foundation that basically sets up Fab Labs all around the world and they teach this work globally. And so, and, and key, uh, critical to that is again, identifying that, that tool set. So Neil in 2015 basically asked myself and George Church to teach the biological version of how to make, which is what led to the course, how to grow almost anything. And so the questions that you're asking are really kind of critical and foundational to this course that we teach, because in a very similar way, if you want to get, as you're saying, um, people from all around the world engaged in the life sciences, you need a wet lab. You need you know, PCR machines and centrifuges and plate readers and all of these tools, many of which are actually quite extensible, uh, expensive, and also many are quite inaccessible. And in, in bio in particular, you also need reagents, right? And that's one of the massive parts of the supply chain that um, can can sometimes be overlooked. You know, where do you get the polymerase and the enzymes and the maybe, DNA from? Maybe explain what reagents are for the non-bio yes. people. So when we're talking about reagents, and again, you know, for, for the non-bio folks, Biology and the, white sci the, the life sciences, it's really like, it feels sometimes like, um, you know, like, a, a, um, what's the word I'm trying to say? It feels almost like, like, like magic. You know, you got this, like these little clear colorless fluids and you're mixing them together. <laughs> and it's very, very digital, very, very different than digital fabrication or making circuits, right? Like when you're building something tangible with your hands, you're getting lots of feedback as you build as to whether or not the thing is working, right? And in biology, you know, often you're mixing together these clear fluids. And at the end of that process, you run some type of an assay or an experiment or a test to see, did my experiment work? But it can go for quite a many, many steps before you actually can get that answer. And so when we talk about reagents, we're talking about basically the ingredients that you mix together. So I'll give one example. For example, um, one of the most powerful uh, technologies in molecular biology is something called polymerase chain reaction, which is basically a DNA copy machine. You might start, you could literally have a single copy of a DNA and then using uh, polymerase chain reaction or PCR, you can amplify that single copy to billions of copies. And to make that work, you need um, these different template DNA strands. So actual DNA molecules that normally you would order from a company and they would send them to you and you would, they'd be synthesized and then you'd, you'd uh, use them in this reaction. And then also a, uh, an, an enzyme, a protein, called DNA polymerase, which facilitates that copying capability. So all of those are different biomolecules, the reagents that you would need, and you mix them together, and then you, you basically cycle that reaction at different temperatures to get the, get the, uh, the, the DNA amplification to work. In my context, in the, and, and to go to your question of how do we actually get these tools out there everywhere, well, where do you get these enzymes from? Because they also need to be refrigerated at very cold temperatures. So there's a quote unquote cold chain question, which we saw during the pandemic, right? If you want to distribute any kind of biological materials that require refrigeration, very, very challenging from a, from a supply chain perspective. So, you know, for us, uh, and for me personally, you know, I'm very interested in the global South. I'm very interested in my colleagues in Africa and Latin America that are trying to build out biology labs. And how do we get reagents and tools to those spaces if you can't even order a DNA molecule because the, synth the synthesis companies don't even ship there, right? So again, I want to shout out my colleague, uh, Jenny Malloy from the UK, who's been leading a bunch of interesting projects. One's called ReClone, um, which is really focused on the, uh, the local production of enzymes that have gone off patent. So again, I mentioned very briefly earlier the Bio Summit. It's this uh, this event again that I organized, and we, we just had it the past three days. And one of the big topics was on the supply chain issues and how do we get these reagents out there to communities that are just not on a mailing address that you can normally get these tools sent to. And even if you had a, a PCR machine, a what's called a thermocycler that can adjust the temperature of these reactions, what happens if that thing breaks? You know, there's nobody from Germany or like Boston or Berkeley that's gonna show up and fix that machine for you, right? So there's a big emphasis in our global community around what's called open source hardware, right? So how do you actually have a, a, have a piece of hardware that you could hack and edit and modify and um, fix if you really needed to? So. Going back to the, this question again, you know, in the course that I teach and in so much of the research that I do, we really try to identify as tools and technologies that are one, the minimum tools that we need in our case to execute the curriculum that we've designed and how to grow almost anything, the course I teach. And very briefly, that class, we really focus on um, each week bringing in a global expert in their field, be it George Church or Drew Endy, uh, one of the founders of Synthetic Biology, um, you know, folks like Nina Tandon, who does tissue engineering work, you know, whatever the topic might be. And you get this, this kind of lecture uh, on a, on a um, 
a cutting edge topic, but then we teach you a skill. We, and that's a really critical part about the course. We teach you a skill and you know, early on, it could be things like you know, amplifying DNA or visualizing DNA on a gel in the process called gel electrophoresis. Later on, we teach you how to build even bigger pieces of DNA, how to engineer organisms. So each week you, you learn a skill and by the end of like 14 or 15 weeks, you quote unquote know how to grow almost anything. You actually have an ability to really demonstrate an expression, a creative expression of yourself through biology and synthetic biology. And, and another key part, part of this is that we do this through projects. So one of the big philosophies around learning at the Media Lab is this idea of a projects, peers, passion, and play, that in order to really maximize your learning, you're doing it in the context of, of making a project that's personally meaningful to you. So in the class, we teach you how to use these tools, we teach you these skills and capabilities, and then you express yourself through a final project of some kind. And those projects can be just all over the place, like, you know, microfluidic, like, uh, uh, a, a microfluidic wearable bioreactor for space exploration that can produce like serotonin and other molecules on demand or, um, you know, art based uh, systems for bacterial painting or new textiles that have embedded microbes that can sense and respond to temperature and pressure, you know, all kinds of different things. And for me, you know, when we think about that question of equity and diversity, the most exciting thing that I see is when you've got non-biologists that are creative in some area, and we work a lot with artists and designers, or we'll get urban planners or architects, um, and people that are technical and creative in other disciplines, not in the life sciences and biology. And then you show them the tools, you give them that knowledge, and you give them that, um, uh, that skill set building, and all of a sudden they're expressing themselves in ways that are completely disruptive, super innovative, because if you're just in bio and you've grown up in this field, you're thinking about it through a very particular lens and you've got a, a dogma. And so um, kind of disrupting that dogma happens in a really beautiful way through this multidisciplinary engagement with diverse and community. So, so equity, it's not just like a, a morality and justice thing. It's really an innovation um, uh, perspective as well. Right, right. <clears throat> Look. Uh looking at old problems with fresh eyes, different perspectives. Totally, yes. And, and just, just tactically is the idea that all, uh, you know, in this case for a course or, or just in general, if you yeah. think about this community biology movement, yeah. is it that there's, <clears throat> there's centralized equipment yes. and labs yeah. that people can teleport, you know, telecommute into effectively yeah. and yeah. use and then get the results out? Yeah. Or is the idea that you want to place the this type of equipment yeah. all around the world? Such a great question. So or um, both. I, I, yeah. <laughs> well, so so th there's literally since the start of synthetic biology, there's been a philosophical debate around kind of centralization versus decentralization, right? You've got folks like my colleague Jurendi at Stanford, who's for ages has been saying like every household should have its own DNA synthesizer, right? They should be able to like make locally manufacture your own biomolecular uh, materials, right, in your own house. Have everybody should have their own like DNA, you know, uh, their own like three D biofabricator, you know, etc. And then there are folks like um, my my uh, PhD advisor and colleague at, at uh, the Media Lab, Joe Jacobson, who's really believed we should have centralized facilities for security and safety reasons. And um, and that, you know, really, it's going to be a big entity, like a big foundry that's going to ship stuff out from a centralized location. Um, how it's probably going to unfold and has been unfolding is probably going to be something in the middle. And what we've seen through How to Grow Almost Anything in a really interesting way, um, and um, I'd encourage uh, or love for your, your viewers and listeners um, you know, we to check out, we just published a, a paper in Nature Biotechnology on the course, uh, How to Grow Almost Anything. And there's uh, some news articles as well that maybe we can link to um, after the podcast. Sure. Um, and so in the course and in the, the newsletter, uh, the, the news articles, we talk about our global model for learning and innovation where the idea is basically to one, have these what we call super course sites. So for example, places like the Media Lab at IT, MIT, like the, the Wies Institute at Harvard, where you've got very sophisticated cutting edge tools. You've got the microscopy tools and the imaging technologies and you know all of the, uh, the different um, cell culture facilities, et cetera, super cutting edge. But then you can enable regional nodes that might be more like a, a college biology laboratory or even a high school biology laboratory that can do some very, very simple experimentation, but nothing too crazy specific. And then the, at the most extreme is the question of, you know, how do you engage folks that are just totally out of the uh, supply chain and are not near a lab at all, but they have a computer and an internet connection, right? And this has always been one of the big uh, holy grails of open learning is how do you do distance learning with the life sciences when you need to be in a wet lab, right? And what happened for us was it was both obviously, you know, incredibly challenging time, but also in the end, a great gift was the pandemic. 
Now, in 2020, I'll never forget, this was like March 2020, um, I was actually teaching how to grow almost anything at MIT when the, the news came out that, oh, MIT is canceled and everybody <laughs> needs to leave tomorrow, <laughs> right? Like we're literally sitting in class and everybody's phones are going off and, you know, people are like, holy shit, like this is real. Like we all have to leave campus in a day, you know? And, um, and again, yeah, I'll never forget that moment. And I'll also never forget the moment when we taught that class again in person and we were all back in class again. And that was a, another quite a journey like two years later. But what happened when that when that that moment occurred and all of a sudden our students had to leave, from a faculty instructor perspective, we were like, all right, well, what do we do? The whole kind of magic of this class is that the students are doing hands-on wet lab work and now they all have to go home. And we had just acquired, I think that year or the year before, um, a low cost liquid handling robot from an amazing company called Opentron. So shout out to, to uh, the Opentrons fam. Um, and Opentrons was actually founded by a good friend of mine, Will Canine. Will was a member, was also a social justice activist, was a member of Genspace, which is a community lab in Brooklyn and New York. And he was basically a hacker and was like, liquid handling robots are normally like tens of thousands of dollars. Why can't I make like a $2,000 liquid handling robot and really try to democratize the process of biological automation? And he succeeded in making these low cost robots. And we had a couple of them at MIT. So when the pandemic hit, we were like, well, why don't we use these robots and actually have students, even if they're MIT kids from like across the dorm, across the way in their dorms that can't physically come into a lab, or if they're students at home, or if there are listeners for the course that are in like Taiwan or anywhere that with an internet connection, why don't we teach them how to program Python and have them actually run their bio experiments with these low cost robots? So we were like, why don't we give that a shot? And over the course of the next two years, we figured out how to take a whole bunch of our curriculum and basically automate it and put it into the hands of these robots. And so at that point, you just needed one teaching assistant that was in the lab to set up the robot. And then students could program those robots from anywhere around the world and then run their experiments. So we basically had a cloud learning lab. And that ended up being just a hugely innovative moment for us. And um, even as the pandemic has now eased, and obviously we're now back in person again, um, we've maintained and are growing that uh, distance learning capability through these robots. So we're getting more robots. We're enabling what we, what we call our, our, our regional nodes all around the world. So like colleagues in you know Taiwan, colleagues in um, you know Vancouver, et cetera, who have these robots, they are now enabling more capacity for global learners to actually execute their experiments. So each year as we've been kind of going moving forward with this, this course, it's both an advancement of the curriculum and the skills that we teach, but then also the network of students, the network of mentors, and then now the physical spaces, and then also the robotic capability that we've been building out. So all of that collectively kind of gets to your question of like, Yes, and, right? We want to have the tools locally available so that, you know, if you want to go and actually be in a wet lab and work, we want that to happen. But if you can't, that's all right. You know, just get an internet connection and a computer and you can still program those robots. And one of the really kind of interesting things as well from a, a biosecurity perspective, you know, you can have broad access, but you can still enable a certain level of safety and security by having those robotics in a place like MIT or the Visa Institute. So um, it's been a really exciting model for us over the past couple of years. And now that we've kind of shown that this is possible, um, there are just so many amazing opportunities that we're pushing for now. And the biggest thing we need is help. So, <laughs> so you know, come join us. Actually, I should mention the class kicks off, um, you know, uh, on February um, 7. And so I'm not sure exactly when this podcast is going to go live, but even if it's after Feb 7, um, you can come and join uh, join the class. So if you come check out my uh, my social media at David Sun Kong, both on Twitter and Instagram, I posted about the course. We've got a little application there and anybody around the world can apply and join us. So and that's one of the best parts for me. We end up having this wonderful in-person classroom of MIT Harvard students. And again, so many of them are artists, designers, people that have never been in a wet lab before. And then we have this global classroom that is just full of amazing, interesting, you know, students that are have so many interests and and are, have just come from such diverse backgrounds. And now that we've done this for a number of years, we've got this great group of virtual TAs that supports the virtual classroom. And so it's such a rich learning environment. We have a bunch of asynchronous spaces where people can engage with each other when class is not happening. And you know, it ends up being just an incredible community and movement that we've been building over the past bunch of years. Amazing. And uh, just just as a plug for that, <clears throat> is it is it mostly Students or or can anybody, be anybody. you know established executives oh, retirees. My gosh. Oh, this and, is, and do you make sure it's affordable? It's free. <clears throat> it's free. It's totally free. Yeah, wow. the, oh, really? the listeners can join and uh, and just listen down on the course for free. 
And um, part of what we do too is um, is uh, we basically through the robotics are also enable a certain subset of our listeners to do the experiments along with the MIT Harvard students. So um, we basically have global listeners that are folks that just can pop in whenever they want to listen to lectures. And then we have what we call co our committed listeners who are the ones to sign up to really do the work. And so the ones that, and again, this happens every year, and I'm sure you see this as well in different types of activities. Like there's always the initial core group, and then you get the attrition over time, and then you really see who's going to stick with it, right? Sure. And so the ones that are really stick with it, I mean, they obviously get the most out of it because they're with us the whole, every step of the way for the entire journey. And yeah, it's just such an enriching experience, I think, for the MIT Harvard students and the global learners because we're all in it together. It's a big learning community. And so people will post questions on the Slack like, oh, how do we, what's going on with this? And you'll get like 50 responses from the TAs, other students that know stuff. So it becomes this really special like learning family that develops and just gets bigger and richer over time as we continue to grow this, this project out. Amazing. Let, let me, let me, uh, <clears throat> I saw the Nature uh, yeah. magazine uh, article. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, they, they didn't go into detail, but they mentioned this quote and I want yeah. you to react to it. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Uh, the self-replicating nature of biology could result in devastating consequences for entire ecosystems if symbiote tools are used unethically, maliciously, or without critical awareness of unintended outcomes. Yes. And, and it kind of relates to some of what you were talking about, centralization versus decentralization. Totally. Yeah. So what are some of the dangers we should be aware of or, yeah. or case studies yeah. from history? And then... And then, you know, how do we mitigate those risks? Yeah, super, super great question. And, you know, I, I really want to emphasize here too, like in the context of the class, there's skill building, but a core part of every single class is principles and practices and ethics. So I really want to shout out and acknowledge my colleague, uh, Megan Palmer, who um, helps to teach class number one. And that's the first class is about ethics, actually. And I, you know, personally for me and my own experience as a technologist, ethics is often like this terribly underemphasized topic that I think, especially when you're talking about powerful exponential <laughs> technologies, you know, if we're talking about the age in we live in now, the, the age of synthetic biology, the age of artificial intelligence, we need ethics and an emphasis on ethics more than ever. And I think there's a really, really powerful and um, kind of profound way in which all of us that have power and privilege need to be interrogating, why are we doing these projects? Like, what is the purpose here? Who's going to benefit? Who's not going to benefit? Who's going to be left aside? And so on. All of those questions are, are need to be considered as we um, embark on a technological project. So um, so that's just a, as an opening preamble to your question. Um, I think in general, what we teach in How to Grow, um, it's basically the, the one of the, the best ways I like to describe it. Um, you know, Cambridge is one of actually the most regulated bio, um, uh, bio lab um, Kind of municipalities on planet Earth. You know, think about Cam Cambridge, Massachusetts, right? You got Harvard, you got MIT, and you got Kendall Square, and all of these biotech companies everywhere. And so, uh, one of my uh, my friends and colleagues, Sam Lipson, he's been basically regulating um, safety, biosafety in Cambridge for like 30, 40 years. One guy has been a part of this. And so, Sam, um, when he talks about um, both community biology and also the work that we do in How to Grow, the level of kind of biological danger that we teach is basically um, what you have in your kitchen is more dangerous than what we do in, the, in this, this work, basically. So if you're bringing like raw meat or fish home from um, the, uh, uh, the market, you've got more dangerous microbes than what we have. You know, <laughs> We work with really domesticated microorganisms that um, have to survive in very specific media that in many ways don't replicate what is out there in the natural world. Um, you know, again, I've done a lot of work in uh, microbiome science and research where you've got in the natural world, and I think we're going to talk about biota beets in a little bit too, where, you know, you've got these, these incredible communities of microorganisms that are in the soil, on our bodies, basically everywhere in the built and living world. And um, it's very, very complex and keeping them alive in a laboratory is actually really hard. So, um, so at certainly biosafety level one, which is what we do work on in How to Grow, um, it's all very, very biologically safe. The biggest risk to our students is usually things like, you know, glassware or, you know, kind of, uh, you know, bleach in cleaning their, their, um, their uh, um, experiments up. So the safety level is, is very, um, it, it's a very safe course in that way. However, um, again, I think conceptually, of course, um, it is be getting easier and easier to do things like synthesize DNA. And that's where, you know, again, one of our, our uh, sponsors for the course is Twist Biosciences. And again, I want to acknowledge Emily LaProust and, and the amazing scientists and researchers at Twist. Um, DNA synthesis is becoming increasingly cheaper, right? Um, and so how do you regulate DNA synthesis, which is often honestly a, a bigger question in my mind, 
Um, Because that's where a lot of the quote unquote danger is, is, you know, the quote unquote biological code and what we represent in DNA. And so there are a lot of efforts on uh, building together consortia of industry um, and companies that are regulating sequences, screening for any dangerous pathogens, et cetera, that might be synthesized. Um, and so so that uh, that ends up, again, I think that's a much more sophisticated level of danger when you're talking about, um, about synthetic biology that um, at least for the courses that we teach, um, we don't really get to that level. But um, certainly, I think as you enable um, more and more actors to be involved, and if they can become more and more sophisticated, then there, there definitely is uh, are, are issues of concern. So, you know, to me, I think the the question of being able to have um, centralized screening and registering, in particular, of DNA synthesis technologies, is really really important, and um, I think it's something we definitely should are doing and should continue to do. Um, but you know, at a more fundamental level. I think there's a larger question of kind of DNA literacy that the course is really emphasizing, right? Um, you know, it's my belief that we should be living in a world where um, where the broader population is just more aware of biology and the life sciences, right? People should understand what DNA and RNA and proteins are. And it's funny, you know, you see like something that happened in the pandemic where um, there is so much scientific misinformation and there is a, a situation where you've got a lot of folks that um, don't necessarily have the right, um, the right, um, um, just technical framing around what's happening, right. and uh, you know, again, as as somebody that was doing a lot of science communication during the pandemic, um, it was really frustrating to kind of feel that our larger population just didn't have this kind of fundamental literacy. So, um, to me, you know, innovation and there's there's always kind of a a, a a fine edge between both innovation and learning, right? So, as we create these community labs, as we enable these um, skills and protocols and tools to get out there more. There's a lot of amazing learning that can happen. There's a lot of amazing innovation that can happen, but then you are increasing the risks, right? And so to me, um, having, and, and this is one of my personal deep beliefs is that you really wanna do learning to the extent possible in a community context. Like when our students go and learn, they're learning with peers and you're doing it within a culture, right? Um, and that's a, that's a pun I visualize <laughs> too, haha. <laughs> but, uh, but, but in terms of a human culture, right? When you learn with your peers and your peers are taking ethics seriously and your peers are asking, well, when I make this diagnostic, is this really gonna be something that's gonna benefit people? And can I kind of analyze and think forward about how it could be used both in, in intended consequences and unintended consequences? And so um, when you've got that type of training and you've got that type of culture, it, in my opinion, it really does dramatically reduce those types of risks. And I know for myself in the community biology movement, the level of care that's um, that's brought into community labs and a lot of these centralized networks is often, in my personal experience, much greater than what we see at very prestigious technical institutions where I think, and this is in my personal view, um, an unhealthy attitude of like, let's just go invent stuff and we'll deal with the consequences later, right? Like, let's just right. go invent and then, you know, we'll figure it out <clears throat> later whether or not this is good or bad, right? Right, and, and intuitively, what I would guess is, you know, I kind, I kind of almost relate it to chemistry class in high school right yeah. in that like yeah. we're all we're all learning the fundamentals we got the bunsen burners right yeah, it's, yeah. it's a safe yeah. environment right yeah. um but so so putting mit and your course aside yeah the dangers that nature brings up <clears throat> do you I, I assume that's happening at the at the more advanced levels right oh, where yeah. it's where it's yeah. advanced oh, yeah. synthetic biologists are going deep they're yes. they're, they're on, on the edges of yes. what's possible yes now let me ask you this question which is do you think that these risks are more likely to occur if if there's kind of an accident at that edge? Yeah. Or do you think there are actors, you know, whether state funded or not, you know, yeah. around the world that are intentionally going after those things? Like, yeah, yeah. Where, where do you think those risks would come from? If, yeah, if, yeah, yeah. It's it's a great question. I, I'll, uh, I'll, in a way here, also shout out my colleague at, at the Media Lab, Kevin Asvelt, another, another professor at, uh, at MIT. And he's been studying this question around existential risk and these types of, you know, basically catastrophic threats. And obviously, um, you know, biology represents one of them. You know, we've seen through the pandemic what can happen um, with a virus that is, uh, uh, you know, that is is uh, evolved in a certain way and, and what type of damage that can do. And so, you know, to me, I think um, a lot of the risks are for sure in um, these kind of these, these uh, sort of more cutting edge labs that are working with, for example, certain types of viruses, right? Um, which is not stuff that we even come remote to touching in, in the courses that I teach, but 
Um, so there are certain areas, and you know, again, my, my colleague Kevin has really spoke eloquently about this, where we should just not go there. You know, like we should collectively as a civilization be like, well, you know, we don't need to be going into these areas of research because the likelihood of something really bad coming out of it is going to outweigh the, um, the potential benefits, right? And so there's a lot of folks like Kevin that do this analysis, and um, I'm grateful to him. <laughs> I'm grateful <laughs> to him and folks that, that are up at night thinking about this. But, um, but there are those domains of research. And, you know, there's sort of this kind of, and this is, again, one of the, one of the you know, kind of double-edged swords of openness, right? Like you want to share, like my personal philosophy overall is that you want to get data out there, you want to share protocols and so on. But it's like, there's certain things that we should not share, right? There's certain areas of research that actually really are dangerous that, um, you know, if we are publishing and, and putting them out there, then the likelihood of something bad happening can be high enough that we really shouldn't be. And so, um, so I think that there are those domains of research and, you know, folks like my colleague Kevin have been spending a lot of time identifying those technical areas and also trying to broker agreements between researchers to say that, hey, we're actually just not going to research these types of viruses, for example. Right, right. And, and you know, someone who would debate against that, you know, just to, to steel man it would probably say, well, we do need to yes. study these things, even though they're dangerous, because it could totally. save lives. It could. Yes. So, so, I, so I could I could see it's, why it's a healthy debate and why. So it's, yeah. Ethics is going to become even more and more important as we continue to advance our technologies. Oh, totally. Completely. It's a fierce debate. And I personally, um, you know, again, I personally, especially where we are in kind of the larger state of humanity, um, I lean much more towards being cautious, actually. Like, I do think that, um, and it's hard, right? You know, in the age of AI that we're in, and again, in the, in the biological, technological, biotechnological revolution that we're in, um, I personally would far prefer us to move slowly. I would prefer us to just take our time and ask ourselves these questions because, you know, we're so much, I think, of the challenges that we face as a civilization come from unintended consequences of technology, right? It's us running full steam ahead in certain directions and not thinking through what's going to happen with pollution, what's going to happen with certain materials that can't biodegrade, um, you know, all of our this kind of, you know, larger extractive approaches that we have towards you know, our planet and nature. And so, you know, the capacity to just slow down and like, you know, take things and, and be more be more cautious, I think, for me personally, is something that um, I think we absolutely should do. And we can balance that with the areas of research that we know are safe and that are going to be enabling for creativity, right? Like, I'm really proud of the class that we teach and the work that we do because, you know, there's so many beautiful things you can do that are just completely safe, that are right. really, really uh, unquestionably safe, and that are going to allow for new levels and domains of innovation and exploration and creative expression. And, you know, I mean, Joe, I'm sure you, I know you've experienced in your, your life, like, when you when you learn how to do something new, and you're able to suddenly express yourself somehow, and it could be through art or poetry or science or technology. I mean, it's it's one of the most fundamentally human things that we can do to express ourselves creatively and channel something that's personally meaningful us into the world, into some kind of amazing project or artwork or anything like that. And so to me, um, being able to create venues for that type of expression and self-liberation through creativity doesn't get much better than that, you know? Yeah, no, I, I do. I, I actually... Um... <clears throat> I'm a big proponent of doing things that are new and uncomfortable. Yeah. And yeah. and because we all have things we we've always wanted to do, but a yes. lot of people are a lot of us are embarrassed to like try something new because yeah. then you go right back to being a beginner. Right? Oh yeah. yeah. So my, my you know brief dorky example is I, I picked up surfing recently. Oh, know? that's I'm awesome, like, man. I'm like that's so you know cool. the old you know the old gray bearded dude <laughs> you know who's like you know on the on the baby waves, but I'm having yeah. so much more fun than yeah. You know I went I went snowboarding recently and I grew up snowboarding. Oh wow. Like, Nice. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm pr Respect. pretty advanced. Like I'm not, you know, doing, you know, McTwists or things like that. But, yeah. um, it, you know, I feel like it's a, it's a mountain I've conquered. So, count conquering new mountains. Um, but, so, so, uh, but just to to double click on your point here, <clears throat> I, I tend to agree in that, you know, if you're doing to do a Pareto chart, right? Of, yeah. I guess, reward to risk ratios. Yeah. There's so much. Uh, at least from my viewpoint, there's so much low hanging fruit of, exactly. of ex exploration exactly. yeah. um, that you could do without ever touching any of the dangerous stuff, right? Yeah. Like there's still uh, lots oh. to be discovered. So, well, and, and there's an interesting kind of other flip of that. You know, here I want to shout out my colleagues at Revive and Restore. I think I mentioned to you Revive and Restore. They're um, an organization founded by uh, Stuart Brand and uh, Ryan Phelan. 
and revive and restore is using synthetic biology and biotechnology for conservation purposes. Okay, so, and um, they've been in the news quite a bit for things like uh, trying to de extinct. Um, uh, animal and plant species like the woolly mammoth or the American chestnut tree or the passenger pigeon, which are these keystone species that um, have gone extinct that that the, the the theory of change and the hypothesis goes that we can bring them back and really lead to ecosystem restoration and in some cases mitigation of climate change. And so, you know, we're living through this current larger mass extinction that's happening on planet Earth right now. And because of climate change and the way that our planet is so rapidly altering um, itself, so many species are dying out because they are unable to um, evolve quickly enough, right? Uh, one example of a project that we're working on right now with Revive and Restore is around corals and coral conservation, right? Temperature, um, ocean temperatures are rising dramatically and so many corals are being wiped out and corals are one of the single most important ecosystems out there in the ocean. And if we have a dead ocean, there's gonna be a dead planet, you know, like we are gonna be totally screwed if, if the oceans continue on the trajectory that they're on. And so, for an organization like like uh, Revive and Restore, the question of using advanced biotechnologies is being weighed in this kind of Pareto chart or this sort of risk rate, uh, um, this uh, risk benefit analysis, looking at survival of key um, key ecosystems, right? Like if we don't use these technologies, then what is the the risk of to our ecosystems? And so. Um, there are a lot of challenges there. So just again, taking that, that coral example, you know, if we want to try to save corals, then we need to figure out how to make them more temperature resilient because the ocean, because of the rise in ocean temperatures. So, um, you know, there's a few approaches. Like one, for example, is like taking corals that are more temperature resilient and moving them to places uh, where you've got more monocultures and creating a more heterogeneous ecosystem of corals, and then en enhancing the resiliency of that that coral population. But then you start getting into synthetic biology land where you can ask, well, what about like coral probiotics? Like what about introducing microorganisms that can create more temperature resistant corals? Or what about genetically engineering the corals themselves, right? Like that's a much more um, kind of uh, um, um, more, um, what's the word? Just a more a more um, significant intervention, right? right. And so, so there you're, you're again asking this risk reward question from a climate perspective where you know, we are driving off a driving off a cliff like really, really fast right now. And maybe we need to be taking some more drastic measures to try to increase the survivability of some of these species. Otherwise, you know, we're facing really, really great risks if we if we lose corals in the ocean, for example. Right. Wow. It's a lot. <laughs> My mind's just reeling with, it's with a all lot. that. Because then you could imagine the the movie scenario where it's like, oh, we introduced this this coral and it ate the other coral and oh, dude, it, yeah. know, everything went there's, bad. But there, well there's <laughs> a other I mean again the to, to really acknowledge my colleagues there, um, you know, there's unintended uh, unintended uh, um, consequences of technology. And actually, Ryan Phelan, she just did a, a really marvelous TED Talk recently um, called Intended Consequences, right? And this, the ecosystem side to me is so amazing, right? Um, you know, again, um, these days, um, you know, one thing I think we'll talk about a little bit later, I, I've been teaching this class at MIT called Ancient Future Technology, which has really been bringing in um, non-Western perspectives on science, um, knowledge production, um, in, in looking at um, you know value systems from folks from, for example, indigenous cultures and, and backgrounds or Eastern culture and philosophy. And you know for so many of my uh, my friends and colleagues and mentors that um, come from indigenous backgrounds, you know there's a different type of like relationship with nature. Um, that those communities have. And what I've learned from my colleagues at Revive and Restore, you know, you look at the Amazon and, for example, and the rainforest there, it's not just like, oh, we just let the rainforest like run wild. There's actually been land management that's happened there over thousands of years. Like the indigenous right. peoples there, they really understand what a harmonious balance in nature is. And it's not that there's no intervention, there is intervention, but there's thoughtful intervention, right? There's right. intervention that's done with deep intention and awareness of what harmony in the ecosystem is like. Right. So it's not that we shouldn't be intervening in nature. It's just a question of how we're doing it, for what purpose, and is it just extraction so we can take out materials and, you know, sell products? Or is it, you know, a deeper kind of uh, knowing, right? And so I think for me, um, you know, that's the balance that we have to strike. And and I, um, I'm i personally very hopeful. And again, a big part of this, this course that I teach is really trying to find that balance between having um, a value and mindset that can borrow from these cultures that really know how to live with the earth, but still leveraging the very cutting edge tools and technologies like AI, like synthetic biology, and really kind of bringing together the old ways with the new to try and find a more harmonious path forward. So. So we'll right. see, we'll see how it right. unfolds, but that's the hope. That's really right. the hope. I mean, it kind of reminds me of like, 
to, to your point, like indigenous cultures that would, you know, tactically burn a- areas exactly. of the forest, exactly. right? Because they knew exactly. that would lead to, you know, better farm management or, you know, a healthier forest, et cetera. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, let me, so you did a, te- <laughs> just to switch gears a little yeah, bit. Yeah, of course. You of did course. a TEDx talk. Yes. And you asked the question, can hip hop save biotechnology? <laughs> so <laughs> I want to ask you, how can hip hop save biotechnology? Oh man, what a question. Um, <laughs> I meant that um, as a provocative one in the context of this talk, but um, but yeah, you know, I I you know part of my background, as I mentioned, you know, I I am a, an, an artist and, and love to express myself through music. Um, you know, back in the day, um, not much less these days, but you know, I used to do a lot of beatboxing and freestyle rapping, and um, and I'm currently still a DJ, so I spend a lot of time out there um, when I can. Um, you know rocking a party. So if there are any parties for nerds, especially for nerds, that's kind of my special <laughs> thing. Like, you know, MIT parties, uh, you know, iGEM for a long time, the International Genetically Engineered Machines uh, competition. I was the iGEM DJ for, for many years. So um, the nerdy are my audience. So you're perfect. You're, you're perfect. fishing in the right water. Perfect. That's great. So so if you know, we want to do a Joe Blair podcast uh, party anytime, <laughs> just count me in. I'm down. I'm down to DJ. But um, but yeah, you know, um, the, the TED talk was really kind of framed around this project that I've been working on for a number of years called Biota Beats. And Biota Beats came out of my community lab. So, you know, I've talked a little bit about um, East Meets West Bookstore and EMW, my art technology and community space. And, you know, imagine if you possibly can, like a Chinese language bookstore with kind of like Chinese, uh, uh, you know, texts that are mixed together with like, you know, poetry chat books and like, you know, uh, CDs and gear from, you know, hip hop artists and, um, you know, a gallery space. And, you know, at one point we had a recording studio. So this really kind of multidisciplinary mix of, of creatives and people from different cultural backgrounds all in one space. And probably in 2017, I want to say, or 2016, um, my community lab, my community biology lab at EMW, we had started. Uh, we decided we were going to we were going to participate in the in the international genetically engineered machines competition, iGEM. And so we basically, uh, um, you know, we were having a meeting like, what should we do for this project? iGEM is this project based competition globally. And I remember this community member was like kind of looking and you know because we have a lot of DJs that are part of my community, there's like a turntable in the corner. And then uh, we were talking about the microbiome, which is an area of, of research I was really diving into at the media at uh, uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory at that time. And the community member was like, hey, like, what if we combined microbiome research with that? And like points at the turntable. And like all of us were like, what if we did combine that? That sounds awesome. <laughs> and so um, thus was born this project, Biota Beats. And I'm a big hip hop head. You know, when I first started DJing, um, my whole, um, you know, I grew up listening to like 90s hip hop, you know, Trap Called Quest and, um, you know, Nas and just, all, you know, all these amazing artists. And, you know, to me, um, when I first started DJing, I was, I was a turntable DJ. So I had vinyl records and turntables and, uh, you know, mixer and would, would DJ that way. Obviously, we've shifted into a much more kind of electronic mode these days with the different controllers. But, um, you know, Biota Beats was basically this kind of homage to the original hip hop DJ. And we basically took uh, a, 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 a turntable and hacked it and turned it into a cell incubator. And we had these records that we called Biota Records that are basically these laser cut um, records that are shaped like vinyl, except that you can pour cell media on there um, and that you can basically enable microbial growth. And we would swab you know, different objects or body parts and take the microbes, culture them on the surface, and then They'd be inside this incubator, and then the incubator had like a little a little camera on top and a microcontroller, and we'd image the microorganisms over time, and we collect data about like the cell growth rate, the number of colonies, etc. And so we'd have these data streams that came in, and then we had these uh, computer scientists that we worked with and musicians to then turn that data into uh, via via algorithm into music into different MIDI that we would then, you know, make beats out of. So you're literally listening to the music of your own microbiome and your own quote unquote biota beat, you know, for microbiota, which are the, the, the collection of organisms that are, are part of the human body or, or the built or the, the, uh, the environment. So we, we basically launched that project for iGEM and um, over the years, it's just been such an amazing and fun project. Um, you know, pretty soon after the iGEM project, uh, one of the, one of my favorite stories. So this was in 2017, April 2017. I was giving a talk in Boston um, at this event called On Cube. Shout out to my brother Tony Chan in Boston. And um, by, basically, by the way, I uh, I I did an internship for uh, Tony Chan. Shut and up! I helped organize an On Cube. No yeah, way! It was 2012. 
Dude, that yeah. is wild. So, so that talk. Big that, shout out. Big Tony. shout out. Big <laughs> shout out to Tony. Big shout out to big brother Tony. Um, 2017, that talk that I gave, April 2017, completely changed my life. That was like a life-changing talk. And um, one of the reasons why, uh, when I when I was, and it was at the Boston Public Library, which they had renovated. I hadn't been to it recently. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful venue. And of course, speaking at that same on cue was one of my heroes, the legendary, the iconic DJ Jazzy Jeff. So Jazzy Jeff is basically, you know, one of the one of the performers there, and I knew he was going to be there. And you know, we're doing this BiodeBeats project, and I was just like, I need Jazzy Jeff to be a part of this project. So I set up in the green room like a little a little community bio lab. I brought some, you know, Biota records and some, you know, some uh, some reagents and some materials <laughs> to actually, you know, get some of his microbes because I wanted to make beats out of his, his microbes. And uh, you know, we're in the green room getting ready for our talks, and um, you know, I go up to, to Jeff and I'm like, Hey, you know. DJ Jazzy Jeff, like I'm, um, you're, you're my hero. Like I, I love your work so much, and you know, working on this project called Biota Beats, where we're making music and also hip hop beats out of microbes and microbial data. Could I, could I sample some of your microbes? You know, <laughs> and literally, I, I, you know, Jazzy Jeff, like you know, one of one of just this iconic, you know, legend in hip hop, is like looking at me, and he's like, you know, David, like this is the weirdest question anybody's ever asked me, <laughs> but yes, you can have some of my microbes. So he proceeds to like, you know, swab some of his like oral microbiome and some from his hand, I think some from his nose, you know, whatever. And we're, <laughs> we're swabbing it onto these plates. And I have this hilarious photograph of like him, you know, doing the swabbing. And he is just so stoked. He's got this like ear to ear grin. He's just like so happy to be doing this. He doesn't know what he's doing, but he's just like, this is awesome. And we ended up collaborating, you know, we made a, made some Biota Beats out of his uh, microbes. And I remember um, his manager at the time, um, you know, we were talking and she called me up and was like, hey, you know, David, we've been learning from you about the microbiome and how, um, you know, the microbes that are, are in the gut and part of the body, how they influence like mood and cognition and all these other things. So, you know, she's like, what if we made a Biota Beat of DJ Jazzy Jeff? Like, cause he was about to go on tour with Will Smith for the first time in like 10 years. So everybody was like kind of all, all like nervous about it. And he's like, what if we did a Biota Beat with Jeff before tour? after tour and during tour and asked and saw how the music changed. And I was just like on the other side of the phone, like just like silently like crying, you know, cause I'm like this, this like hip hop manager, like who has never been in a wet lab. It was not a scientist, like proposed like a controlled, you know, three data point, like scientific <laughs> experiment for me, right. you know, based on Will's micro, uh, based on, on a DJ Jazzy Jeff's microbiome, you know? So, so, you know, that project, you know, I, you know, the joke of the line, like in hip hop save biotech, it's basically this question of, you know, can we actually use the culture, um, the, the human culture, and can we use the arts as a way to increase access? Again, you know, going back to this, this kind of the theme of the podcast, like so much of my work is around equity and access, right? And especially for young people, I don't care like what your background is, what your politics are, you know, and just for humanity, you know, everybody's got a relationship with music. And being able to bring together art and science, to be able to bring together um, something like hip hop, especially for like our young people and um, this generation of, of young people, you know, connecting the hip hop with microbiome science, it just feels like like such a random combination. But when you do it, all of a sudden, young people are like, oh my God, like I can make music out of my microbiome. Like what does my microbiome sound like, right? So it becomes this, this avenue to just get kids in particular excited about science. And um, you know, science and, and just communicating science and teaching science can be really challenging. You know, a lot of it can feel really dry and technical. When we introduce the arts, when you introduce the culture in there, it changes the game completely. What I what I love about this story is um, there, there's there's another element to it that I that I, I think about, which is it's not just about exposure um, to to new ideas or new you know paths. To me, it's it's also about self identity. Mm. Right. Mm. And I'll just relate this to myself in that growing up, I, I first off, I didn't even know what an engineer was. Right. <laughs> um, but I did. I did have a sense of like what a computer scientist was. Right. Yeah. And like when I saw in my mind's eye, like a computer scientist, I thought like, uh, you know, someone who was like in a basement, you know, you know, <laughs> and, and like, you know, no sort of physical um, performance and just like a like a nerd. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And. I just didn't see myself that way, right? Yeah. So I was like, yeah. well, you know, I know I like math, I know I like science, you know, and these computers seem really interesting, but I'm not a coder. Like yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. me. That's not yeah, yeah. And I met and yeah. I you know, and again, like I had to figure out what an engineer was. So I didn't have a uh, a vision of what an engineer was. So I could kind of unlock that and 
you know, make it my own. But I imagine the same thing, you know, you could have the same thing with, you know, other disciplines like biology. It's like, well, I'm not a biologist. I don't want to wear a, a white coat yes. and like yes. be playing around with, with things. But where, yeah. whereas if you see someone like you, who's, you know, by day, <laughs> you know, in the lab and by night, a DJ and is interacting with people from hip hop and actually, you know, kind of has that more, um, multifaceted, multi-dimensional, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. kind of aspect to them, someone young might say, oh, like that could be me, right? Totally, totally. And again, representation matters. You know, it's like, I know I was so lucky growing up um, to have a dad and both my parents were professors, right? So like the idea of being in academia was not even foreign for me. It was almost expected for me, right? So, and again, you know, this is part of my own personal story, but you know, my, my, uh, my dad's brothers and sisters, like my grandparents, when they when they um, were fleeing from China from the Cultural Revolution, they only took out my dad. So, my dad's brothers and sisters basically grew up farmers; they're peasants. And so, my cousins are most of them grew up farmers. And it's like just by basis of total luck, like nothing to do with it, that I that I no choice that I made, no specific agency that I had. I was born to my dad, who was a professor at MIT, you know, the most brilliant electromagneticist on planet Earth. And I got this super privileged, um, this privileged upbringing where I was surrounded by incredible creatives and technical people. And so being able to imagine a life for myself, like what I have now was easy to do, right? And just by basis of luck, you know, my cousins, they did not have that opportunity, right? So for me, you know, and a huge part of my work and why I care so much about this is because you know, each individual, or every human being on planet Earth, we have this infinite capacity for expression and creativity and channeling something really profound from the universe. And um, just giving those opportunities to people is, is so important. And being able to imagine yourself exactly like you're saying in one of these roles, um, a huge thing that I love about a thing like Biota Beats, and you know, again, I wanna shout out my, uh, uh, my friend from the Boston Celtics, I'm a big hoops guy, um, you know, Jalen Brown. Um, you know, we collaborated with Jalen on a, a program called the Bridge Program. And as a part of that, what we did was we had young people go and swap objects all throughout the city of Boston. And with our partners at Ginkgo Bioworks, we then um, basically um, analyzed the, uh, the microbiome, the collective microbiome of these objects, and we created what we called the Boston Biota Beat, so the musical microbiome of the city of Boston. And um, it was this beautiful art piece representing um, the microorganisms that these students found. But again, we're talking about you know science and connecting it to um, an athlete, you know, who's really at the forefront of culture that young people identify with and um, can see themselves as really looking up to. And when an athlete or a hip hop artist or like somebody that's in the culture is like science is cool, you know, like science is actually really exciting and fun. You know, for a lot of young people, that really opens up their minds and their hearts in a way that's very different from somebody that's dry in a lab coat that's like, hey, you know, go like sequence this DNA molecule or whatever. It's like, oh, why do I care? You know, so so all of that, I think, connects back to this fundamental question of like being able to connect with people's sense of purpose and what they care about. Right. So, you know, again, I'm a huge fan of project based learning. And I'm a huge fan of this idea that um, you know you learn the most when you're able to manifest and build something in the world that connects with something meaningful to you, right? Like you as a young person, you know, you're like, I'm not sure how I feel about these nerds, but then you're like, are these computer scientists? That's not really me. But then if you're like, well, what is what is actually happening with this coding, and what are the outputs of these things? And if you can kind of like like get past some of the identity aspects and then really connect with something that's personally passionate and something that you care about. And maybe you combine it with an identity thing where now you see somebody that you respect and you're like, oh, that person's a coder, you know? All of a sudden you're like, I can see that and I can imagine that and I can also express myself in the world in a way that I really care about, you know? And I think that's really where so much of the magic between happens in both learning and in innovation. That's brilliant, that's brilliant. <clears throat> um, why don't we shift gears a little bit to you as a person? Um, you know, we talked a little bit about your, your dad and your upbringing. Yeah. Um, Wanna wanna bring it to your mom a little bit in that yeah. I noticed on your website <laughs> <laughs> you you have a picture of you and your sister and your mom mm -hmm. and you're at Burning Man. Yes. And most yes. Uh, I've never been to Burning Man, but most people most uh, stories I hear about Burning Man do, do not involve people bringing their their parents. <laughs> so, so maybe you can help, help fill in the gap there. <laughs> well, so first off, shout outs to my sister Shing, uh, my Jijie, uh, my big sister Shing Kong, and to my mom. Love you, mom. Um, and yeah, you know, basically I've been going to Burning Man since 2008. 
My sister's been going to Burning Man since I think 2010. I've been now 11 times. My sister has as well. Um, she actually does a lot of work for Burning, BurningMan.org. And, you know, Burning Man, it's it's um, another one of those incredible spaces that for me and I think for so many people um, is this magical place of just profound creative expression, right? You've got folks that are there radically expressing themselves through fashion, art, massive large-scale sculptures and installations, music. There's so much incredible music that happens out there. And so it's this real playground for creative expression and serendipity, you know, be able the ability to kind of just portal your way from one experience to another. And, you know, it's it's for those that haven't gone, you know, I definitely recommend checking it out. And it's a very big, you know, for as an MIT person, it's an engineer's dream because it's literally a city of 80,000 people that gets built over the course of a week plus, you know, a week to a couple of weeks. And then it's gone. It literally gets, you know, returned back to the desert. And it's a celebration of the ephemeral. It's a celebration of um, just the nature of, of life. Life. You know, life has changed. We're all only here on this earth for a very short period of time, you know, where, you know, from a, from a cosmic or even geological perspective, it's just a little second and then we're gone, you know? So Burning Man, I think, embodies a lot of those, those values and that, that um, kind of perspective. And, um, and I remember, yeah, like there was one year, my, my, I'm also a photographer as, as one of my hobbies. And, you know, my, mo- my, my mom is also, uh, was, uh, was also a photographer and, um, she would see all these pictures and be like, you know, I, I want to go to this thing, you know. So, so one year, um, I told my sister, I was like, we got to bring mom out. And you know, at that time, you know, another thing connecting to this, the larger kind of life sciences conversation. You know, my mom has had Parkinson's disease now for more than ten years, almost like fifteen years now. And so she was still, she had Parkinson's at the time. It wasn't, it wasn't so bad that she couldn't really get around. So we brought her out there and, you know, it was a full on, like my mom, like was in a rave, like, you know, like got like lost in a sandstorm, rode like art cars and mutant vehicles. I mean, she did the whole thing and celebrated her birthday actually out there because um, her birthday is August 28th, which is right when uh, Burning Man's happening. And we brought her out twice. So the first year was just like, the first time we brought her out is a very like controlled, like kind of two and a half days. And the second time she came out, it was like, five proper days and there's just an amazing story i'll tell a very short version of it but i'm um, a camp that at the camp my camp at burning man uh the past bunch of years is this amazing crew called robot heart so for those of you that go to burning man you know what robot heart is but uh, robot heart basically specializes in throwing these i would call them collective celebrations that it's a sacred ceremony around sunrise. You know, one of the most magical parts for me about, about being at Burning Man, you're out there in the desert and watching the sunrise and watching the sun come up, it's a it's a mystical experience. Just this totally flat plain and for the first little bit of sun comes out and it's just this incredibly magical moment. And Robot Heart, we specialized in throwing parties where we've got this incredible sound system. It's this double-decker bus that uh, the founder, Geo, and a whole bunch of homies like built that literally was designed to create music in this place where you've got a flat plane, no objects for the sound to bounce back, uh, bounce back on, and it's the Stradivarius of electronic music. And so the best DJs in the world come and they basically create this sacred ceremony for sunrise where they're playing this incredible music, the sun's coming up, you're there with like you know thousands of people just celebrating together. And of course we brought my mom and one year, um, you know, my, my dear friends, uh, my dear friend Gio, the founder, and his brother Gary, you know, they pull up and they see a robot heart pulls up to this art piece that me and my mom and my sister just happen to be at. And, you know, Gio and Gary, they're like, oh, my God, it's Dave Kong and his, his mom and his sister are here. Let's go. It was my mom's birthday that day. We get up on top of Robot Heart, and I forget who's DJing. It was like Skrillex or somebody, you know. It's like about to, it's like DJing. And, like, Gio's looking at my mom and looking at me and my sister, and he's like, Kong, you know, you know what we got to do right now? And I was like. What's that, Geo? And he's like, your mom needs to VJ Robot Heart. And I was like, do the, do the video and the lights. And I was like, what? You know? <laughs> and so literally, this is like my Chinese immigrant mother, you know, on her birthday, like the, the like Robot Heart is like this major, major art car burning man. And they bring her to the front of the bus and like literally like Skrillex is like on her right. And it's my mom like on this mixing board, like doing the lights, you know? And there's like thousands of people dancing at sunrise. <laughs> and my sister and I are just like losing our shit. Just like, is this really happening right now? You know? And my mom was so funny. She's just like, like, you know, she's like playing with the lights. She's like, what? Like, so like, why is everybody, why is this a big deal? She's like, she's like, what? It's just the lights. See, purple, red. And she's like changing the lights and the screens are changing. And she's just like chilling. Like, why is this a big deal? And we're like, mom, like, this is like the biggest party at Burning Man. And you're crushing it. And she's like. So it was awesome, man. Oh, you know, wow. I, yeah, I, I love, uh, you know, my, my robot, my, my, my robot heart fam. I love them so much. And. You know, I love my mom so much. And, you know, just shout outs to all of the, the folks, too, that are caretakers. You know, again, like I, my, my mom and my sister or myself and my sister, we've been caring for my mom through Parkinson's disease for many, many years. And, um, you know, I think there's a, another kind of larger story around 
you know, care and, and health care and how do we think about, um, you know, our, our family members and our community members that are, are in, the, in the final stages of their life, you know, and how do we care for them? And, and it's exhausting, you know, being a caretaker, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful that um, as we can t- continue to develop these very sophisticated uh, medical technologies and precision medicine that will develop a lot of therapies. But then I also am really hopeful for, and just for just the broader society that, um, you know, we can just bring a lot more love, care, and kindness into our healthcare um, system itself, right? Right. Um, Because that's another thing. Like, we've seen my mom get so much better in so many ways just from, you know, more love and more kindness and and being present, you know? Um, So, so, you know, just shout outs to everybody going through it. Um, You know, certainly um, uh, we need a lot more love on this planet. And um, yeah, I'm so grateful that we were able to bring my mom out to the desert for a couple of years. That was... What a... Completely uh, life changing moments. Yeah. What a special memory. So awesome for, for yeah. you all. Joe, you got to come, incredible. dude. You got to come. You're gonna love it. I'm, I'm interested. You got to make it happen, man. <laughs> you got to make it happen. You got to be more than interested. You got to commit. You got to commit. But we'll, we'll talk more about I'm it. Interested. We'll talk more about it. We'll get but, you there. Uh, you know what you're saying though does I, I can relate to uh, somewhat. I, I haven't been on the caretaking side you know, yeah. for an elderly parent. Um, but I have, you know, obviously I've got three kids. So yeah. I'm, oh, man. Totally. So I, I'm a caretaker totally. there. But, uh, you know, part of, because I'm like you, I'm thinking about technology constantly in the future. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I, I, I think I'm in, uh, in the minority on this, but I tend to believe that the last things that would and should be automated away yeah. is that is that human to human oh, caretaking, yes. both at the beginning of life yes. and at the end. Beautiful. Right? Yeah. Totally. And I see all these, you know, well-meaning technologists who are like trying to like, hey, here's a robot so that can talk to your kid, you know, so you don't. Yeah. And I'm like, no, you have to talk to your kid, right? <laughs> Dude, They yes. need to learn how to look yes. a person in the yes. eye and, yes. you know, see their mouth moving yes. and not like, anyway. Yeah. And, and and I think, and I think it's even worse um, <clears throat> in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, elder care, right? Yeah. A lot of people think like, oh, this robot will like, you know, hang out oh. with your grandma. It's like, no, dude, like, and and yes. so and so that's why I, you know, I'm I'm really um, I, I think we need to show a lot more appreciation to the uh, the care you know the professional caregivers. Oh, completely. Um, who completely. who spend that time and yeah. and uh, have that human to human interaction, show that kindness and whatnot. So it's well, very it, important. it gets to I think like for me, uh, um, and I know we're getting into a bit of the philosophy part of the the conversation too, but you know I think that there's a, a a deeper set of questions about like the values of our modern society and what we care about. And, you know, are we a civilization that is really about kindness and family and generosity? I think we aspire to be, but we look at the systems that we create and even the technologies that we create. And, you know, one of my, my big questions is, are we actually doing that or are we actually espousing on a value, but then in, um, in, in reality, you know, potentially counteracting against that value. And, you know, I'll just, you know, again, you know, we're talking about caretaking and end of life care. You know, it's it's a thing that I see and that we see in the West where we're really allergic to death. You know, the whole concept of death is just something that we want to put out of you. Like we we're a, we're a youth centric culture and, you know, we really take something that is essentially the most sacred journey that every single human on this planet is going to go through. And that is dying. Right. Like we are all going to die. And. You know, the way that we've constructed our society in the West where it's like, let's take the elderly and put them into homes or into these places and kind of put them away. Um, you know, it just feels like so the opposite of like what we should be doing in terms of how we can celebrate our our elderly folks and really, you know, have them incorporated into society in a deeper and more meaningful way. And so, you know, I think there's this deeper question around like values and even, you know, I'll use the word spirituality around like how how are we relating to each other? How are we relating to each other? And then also, you know, connecting to my own work, how do we relate to the natural world? And I think there's, um, you know, one thing I appreciate actually a lot about Burning Man. At Burning Man, like, and, you know, when I talk about sunrise and, and just being out there in the desert, and I think for anybody that spends a lot of time in nature, like there's a sense of sacredness and awe that you experience when you're out in the natural world. I mean, one thing I love about being when I'm able to come out here to the Bay Area, man, it's like there's some hikes out here that are just magnificent. I mean, you know, out here in Oakland, like, you know, where my sister is, like 15 minutes away, there's a redwood forest, you know, and 15 minutes away from that, you can go up into the Berkeley Hills and see these incredible views and just be out in nature. And the feelings of awe that I experienced there, the feelings of sacredness that I experienced there, um, you know, it's something that in our Western society, we've kind of stripped out of our lives, you know, like 
but we don't have, I think, it's, it's so much more rare to feel, to feel those, those feelings of awe. And it's certainly not built into our societal life, right? You know, we, when we get together as humans, you know, it's like, where, where are the places that we collectively can experience feelings of awe? Um, you know, is it like concerts, sporting events, you know? So it's, it's something where I think, you know, there's a deeper question of values that I'm very interested in that connects to the technologies that we make, right? Um, and so, you know, my hope is as we continue to move forward in this very critical period in human history, that we're able to fundamentally interrogate our values and our worldviews. And, and this is, again, where I draw a lot of inspiration from my, my uh, folks, my, my community members and colleagues and mentors that come from indigenous backgrounds or um, even from certain Eastern traditions that, um, that look at the natural world as having spirits, as having animacy, as being alive, you know? Um, it's really interesting, like in synthetic biology in my field, we look at uh, one of the big powerful engineering frameworks is that um, thinking about DNA as code. You hear this all the time, DNA is code, right? Or a cell is a computer, a cell is a factory um, to manufacture molecules. And there are these very industrial metaphors that get put onto living systems. And I think, you know, if we continue to look at the natural world as just another machine or a tool, we're going to continue to create problems for ourselves because we are not fundamentally, I think, embracing the natural world as in another way, which is also factually true, which is our ancestors. I mean, literally single celled organisms, fungi, I mean, these are our ancestors, right? So where's the sense of awe and the sense of reverence that we have with the natural world? And so to me, as we move forward, um, you know, we're talking about the sacred passage of life and death, you know, with our, our parents and um, the elderly, and we're looking at our relationship with the natural world. Can we bring a greater sense of reverence and humility? And, um, you know, this goes back to even the earlier question around um, kind of biosafety and, you know, what are we doing there? Like, can we actually slow things down a little bit and try to be more humble in our, um, in our role in the world? So, you know, it's not easy, I think, to, to do that well, but um, it's something that certainly I'm trying to bring into my own research practice and um, it's something that I hope that we can collectively do, especially for folks that are probably listening to your podcast that are at the frontiers of developing really sophisticated technologies that on the one hand can have massive benefits, but on the other hand can also have a lot of unintended consequences that really need to be interrogated and thoughtfully considered. Wow. David, <laughs> you are you are a deep thinker and we could go on for hours. Um, I know oh, we're man. challenged on time. <clears throat> so I just want to uh, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for uh, sharing your time with me and, and the audience. Um, and uh, and I, I want I want everyone to know that they can follow you on LinkedIn. They can follow you on uh, you mentioned on Twitter and uh, Instagram at at David Sung Kong. And you even have a website that's www.davidsuncong.com. Yes. Um, any parting words to share with uh, the world? Uh, parting <laughs> words, you know, just Joe, I just want to thank you so much again for creating the space. It's been so awesome hanging in. And again, you know, we've only known each other for a few weeks, but it feels like, you know, we've, we've really kindred spirits and have known each other for a while. So really excited to keep building with you. Um, definitely want to just plug the course again, How to Grow Most Anything. Um, you know, if you check out uh, the social media, you can find a link to the application there. Um, shout outs to the, my, the Global Community Biosummit. I've mentioned that conference that I organized. You can follow us um, at Biosummit on Instagram, at Global Biosummit. If you're interested in, you know, kind of community biology, grassroots life sciences, um, you can learn more there, uh, biosummit.org as well. And then, you know, in my last little bit there, when I was kind of talking about relationship with, uh, you know, humanity and, and the planet, there's a course I've been teaching at MIT called Ancient Future Technology, which is really exploring that interface between um, you know, ancient ways of knowing and being and future technologies. So um, in that class, we do things like we look at how AI could be used for decoding animal communication or how synthetic biology could be used for conservation and land management or how, um, you know, again, we can bring in our own cultural, spiritual practices into the technologies that we develop and the stories that we want to tell. So um, if you're interested in any of that, um, you know, you can check out uh, ancientfuturetech.org um, and also uh, on Instagram or at ancientfuturetech. All of these different projects that I've mentioned to you, they're all community-based projects. So we have big meetings and working groups where basically anybody can come join. So if you're interested in any of these things, um, please find us. I'd love to build and grow with you. Um, I think all of the work that we do out there in the world right now, and if you look at the challenges that we face, 
space. We've got civilization-wide problems that require global solutions and global communities. So, um, you know, I think it's not an exaggeration. It's just a reality and fact that we really are one global family, one global biosphere. The planet is alive and we are alive with it. We are nature. So um, let's work together, you know, let's work collectively. And, you know, I've got a deep belief that um, if we do that and really come together as a big family, that we can solve any problem that we need to face. Let's do it together. Let's do it, Joe. Thank awesome. you, Awesome. Thank you so much.